All right, as we begin to talk about the last area of tort law here, I want you to read through this overview of this case here. And then uh, once you're done, I want you to think about whether or not you think this meets our definition of negligence or if it meets our definition of an intentional tort. So maybe just pause your video, take a few minutes, read this, and think about whether or not you think it meets either of these classifications. All right. Hopefully what you came to in assessing this incident is that it doesn't really meet classification for either, right? This isn't quite negligence because we know there's some intent here, right? At minimum, we know there's intent to act, right, by the uh, forward in this incident. Now, when we think about whether or not this meets the definition of an intentional tort, I'm not sure that we can classify it as that either, right? Because while we have intent to act, it's unclear as to whether or not we have intent to harm, right? We have a player who is pursuing the ball, kicking the ball, knowing there might be a risk in doing so, but there is no clear evidence that this forward intended to harm, right, by their actions. So the reason I, I share this example case with you is that this case, um, Nabozny versus Barnhill, is the case that essentially defined the concept of reckless misconduct in our American court system. And funnily enough, it happened here in the state of Illinois um, back in 1975. So what happened was essentially the court saw this case. Um, they said, you know what, this doesn't really meet our definition of negligence, and it doesn't really meet our definition of an intentional tort. So they basically created a new standard, which is what we know now as reckless misconduct, right? And based on our, our prior definitions of reckless definition in terms of intent, we know that in a reckless misconduct case, there is intent to act, but there is no intent to harm, right? Which makes it uh, kind of fall right in the middle here of our tort law spectrum. Knowing that in negligence case, there's no intent to act and no intent to harm. In an intentional tort case, there is both intent to act and intent to harm. But this reckless misconduct uh, concept falls right in the middle, right? So in these instances, we have intent to act, but no intent to harm. Um, so this Navasny Barnhill case is really precedent setting, right, in terms of common law, because it establishes this new concept of reckless misconduct and says, hey, not everything fits these strict definitions uh, of negligence and intentional torts. And sometimes people act in a way um, that is reckless, um, and we need to consider that as more severe than a negligence case, but not quite as severe as an intentional tort case. Okay, a little bit more here about the legal concept of reckless misconduct. So this is a, kind of a straight out of your textbook definition. We know reckless misconduct occurs when the actor intentionally performs an act while disregarding a risk known to him, and that risk is so great as to make the harm highly probable. Okay. So when we think about reckless misconduct, really the key question or issue at the heart of these cases is the state of mind of the defendant when they are acting, which, as you can imagine, is a tricky thing to identify, right? Because you're basically asking you know, to be in someone's head as they are making decisions about whether or not to take on a, a risky act. Um, and ultimately, these cases come down to a number of factors, which we'll talk about in the next few slides, but the state of mind is key, right? Understanding whether or not the defendant was aware of the potential risks associated with their actions is going to be key uh, in to proving uh, whether or not they acted recklessly or not. Um, and as we think about reckless misconduct in the context of our field, you know, it's important to realize that you know, there is a lot of physical altercation there that is inherent to a lot of the activities and sports that we put on. Um, but a reckless misconduct incident usually occurs when there's been a disregard for the physical well-being of fellow participants. Uh, and similar to what we looked at with assault and battery, you know, we have the expected conduct or what we consider to be ordinary normal conduct. And then this gray area of, okay, now we've stepped beyond what is ordinary and normal conduct. Okay, I do want to quickly identify some key distinctions here between negligence and reckless misconduct because I think sometimes they blend together a little bit or students get them confused. But there are some key distinctions that I, I think might help clarify. So the first of which is just 
that negligence is sort of this well-established legal principle. You know, we have these four elements that we talked about last week, uh, and there have been, you know, hundreds if not thousands of cases involving our rec or sport field that have gone to a negligence trial. Um, so this is a kind of a well-worn path um, in terms of the legal process. Um, the case isn't necessarily as true with reckless misconduct. Um, 1975 might not seem like um, recent to you, many of you born much later than that, but in the context of our you know, legal system, it's still a fairly new legal principle, meaning that every state is still kind of working out how they apply it or even whether they apply it. There are some states that don't operate under a reckless misconduct standard. Obviously, Illinois does, given that it was born here. but. Important to note that while negligence is pretty well established and, and well understood by our court system, reckless misconduct is still considered to be a fairly new concept. Um, potential damages awarded, there are some distinctions here as well. Um, if you remember back to our initial unit on negligence, we learned that there are basically two different categories of monetary damages that can be rewarded. We learned that there are compulsory damages, which are essentially, you know, put in place to cover any lost wages, to cover any medical bills, basically to make the plaintiff whole again, right, based on the losses they incurred because of the negligent acts. But when we were introducing those damage categories, we also introduced the concept of punitive damages. Um, and if you remember back, we said that punitive damages are damages awarded on top of those compulsory damages. And we also, I think, mentioned that they're typically not given in negligence cases, especially ordinary negligence. Potentially they're given in cases of gross negligence. Um, but they're more likely to be awarded in cases of reckless misconduct or intentional acts. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine why that is, right? Um, again, if we go back to our, our spectrum here, we know that the court is viewing reckless misconduct as more severe than negligence, right, based on the intent to act. Um, therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that courts are probably going to be more likely to award punitive damages in those instances than they would be in a case of negligence where there's simply a careless action that's occurred. All right. So let's talk a little bit about proving reckless misconduct in court. So reckless misconduct can be proven if the following standards are met, okay? First of which, you have to be able to prove that the actor intended to commit the act in question. Um, so we have to be able to prove intent. Uh, again, this shouldn't be surprising given our definition of reckless misconduct and where it falls on the spectrum, right? We know that there is intent to act in reckless misconduct, so it is necessary then for the plaintiff to prove that the defendant intended to act. Um, the plaintiff also has to be able to prove that the defendant actor re disregarded a known risk, right? That there was a known risk, they chose to act anyway. Right. So that, you know, that's going to get into the weeds a little bit on the activity or, or whatever was occurring. But they have to show that the actor disregarded a known risk. They have to be able to prove that the risk is substantial and makes harm highly probable. Right. So whatever the risk was, there has to be, you know, potential harm that is clear um, to the plaintiff in that incident. And there has to be a high probability that harm will occur if that action is taken. Um, and then finally, the actor knows or has reason to believe others are present and in harm's way, right? So obviously, you probably couldn't prove reckless misconduct if someone is acting in a reckless way, but nobody else is around, right? If they're only putting themselves in, at risk or harm, probably not going to have a, a reckless misconduct case. But if there are others present, other athletes, other fans, whatever it might be, then they could prove that that person not only acted recklessly, but knew they were doing so when others were present, which is obviously a problem. All right, so those are the standards or elements that a plaintiff would have to prove in court in order to prove reckless misconduct. A couple other things to think about. Uh, from a plaintiff's perspective here, and that is just kind of what are the other considerations or what is the context of the scenario that might help make the case? Um, and, you know, one of the things to think about are, are the actual activity itself, right? What were the rules of that activity? 
Um, and then back to this question about kind of what the conduct was and did it occur within the normal rules of the game or activity? If so, it may not be deemed to be reckless, right? It might just be part of that activity. Um, but if it went beyond what is expected for that particular game or activity, then we might be dealing with a reckless act. When did the contact occur? This one's interesting, you know, in terms of what the expectations are for risk, right? So did it occur during, let's say if it's a sporting event, did it occur during organized play when it's actually expected to be competitive? Or did it occur during practice or a timeout or maybe even after a whistle blew? These things matter, right? Because there are different expectations for contact and the level of play uh, during, let's say, an organized game versus a practice. So that's an important consideration. Um, and then finally, the age of the participants is certainly something to take into account, right? Uh, especially if we think about reckless misconduct and, and how a lot of these cases hinge on sort of the intent of the defendant and whether or not they disregard a known risk. Well, if someone is of minority age, meaning they're under the age of 18, then it might be hard to prove that they had an awareness of those known risks, right? Or that they had kind of the mental acuity to gauge whether or not this act was going to cause harm. Um, whereas someone who is 18 or over, we would classify as an adult, we would have a higher expectation, right? That they not only know um, the risks that they are encountering, but that they also know the potential harm that can cause. So age is certainly an important factor. Okay, so, you know, in terms of proving reckless misconduct, there's a, a couple other important points to make here. Um, we've looked at reckless misconduct from the plaintiff's perspective. Now I want to just think quickly about what this might look like from a defendant's perspective, just as we have with all these other uh, tort law issues. So if you are the defendant, uh, sport organization or individual in this case, what might be some defenses available to you if you're sued for reckless misconduct? Um, well, the first potential defense, and probably most likely a lawyer will look at, is um, arguing that that intent to act is not there, and rather that instead of an intentional, or sorry, intent, instead of a reckless act, that this was just negligence. So basically you would be arguing it down to be a lower degree of severity, right? So there was no intent to act, it was actually just a careless act, which makes it negligence, which as we know, negligence is on the lesser uh, end of severity on the tort law spectrum, meaning that potential damages are likely to be lower uh, in terms of monetary payment. So kind of arguing it down to a negligence charge would probably be the first line of defense. Um, you know. Some of the same defenses we can use in negligence come up here. So that assumption of risk or consent concept that we talked about earlier could definitely be useful, right? Showing that the other party involved had assumed this risk knowingly that this was an inherent risk that was part of the activity or sport and therefore they uh, acknowledge that risk. Um, another potential uh, defense in this case is that waiver that we talked about last week. Um, now keep in mind that waivers are tricky um, because we know that oftentimes they're only upheld in cases of ordinary negligence. So it might be difficult to utilize a waiver as a defense in a reckless misconduct uh, case. However, it could be useful in supporting that assumption of risk defense because then you can show that there's express assumption of risk. All right, just want to mention a, a couple final things here on reckless misconduct, and then I'll summarize our tort law unit. Um, reckless misconduct is tricky for courts because, you know, on one hand, courts are having to um, balance what, you know, as a society we have deemed sport to be, to be vigorous competition, right? And we've considered that to be good, right? To, for there to be vigorous competition, that it's healthy. And on one hand, we want to encourage that. Right? We want to encourage vigorous competition that is safe. Um, but on the other hand, if you are a court or you're a judge, you also want to make sure those people are being safe. And so they kind of have to balance these two things. Right? On one hand, they don't want to get too involved in sport organizations' rules or policies because they know that they are there to encourage vigorous competition. But on the other hand, they also have to make sure people are safe and that there aren't reckless acts getting in the way of that. 
So from our perspective as you know, sport practitioners, it's important to think about how we can take steps to prevent reckless acts from occurring, um, whether it's participants in a program or activity we're overseeing or athletes on a team that we are coaching. You know, anything we can do to educate and prevent reckless actions from being taken, you know, the less likely we are to be involved in a reckless misconduct lawsuit. All right, really quick wrap up here of our tort law spectrum. Again, I, I know I keep inundating you with this image, but I do think it's helpful in putting all the pieces together here. Um, just remember that this concept of tort law is basically this umbrella area of law that is covering issues where individuals have been harmed because of the wrongful acts of others. And we know now that there are basically these three areas of tort law and that they fall on the spectrum based on the their intent to act and their intent to harm um, on the part of the defendant. So make sure that you understand the classification of each of these in terms of intent to act and intent to harm. And make sure you know what that means um, in the context of, of the court system, right? In terms of how these things, uh, these classifications could impact not just the elements that have to be proven in court, but also sort of the lens through which uh, a judge might view these cases based on their level of severity. All right, quick summary of our whole unit here um, on tort law. Some things to keep in mind, um, definitely be aware of the various tort laws that we just looked at on that spectrum and where they fall. Make sure that you are able to both identify the various elements associated with these tort law issues and that if you were given a scenario, you could actually apply them to a case. And then finally, make sure that you know about the typical tort lawsuits and how you as a practitioner could potentially defend yourself if you found yourself being sued for negligence, being sued for reckless misconduct, um, et cetera, et cetera. So making sure that we're not just looking at these things from the perspective of the plaintiff, but also that we're thinking about these things from the perspective of the defendant and the various defenses that might be available to us if we were to be involved in one of these lawsuits, which now that you've spent so much time learning about tort law, hopefully you will never find yourself in that situation. All right, uh, I think that's all I have. So have a great week. And we'll see you next week.